I'm Rob Jones, and in these modules, I'm going to teach you the basics of working with Reason, as well as show you various methods for composing, producing, and performing to give you the skills necessary to use the software in whatever way you want. I'm assuming you have at least a basic understanding of audio and MIDI, but I'm also aiming to help those who are completely new to music software. The way you approach the course is entirely up to you, and dependent on how quickly you pick up the various techniques along the way. However, I personally recommend going through each module slowly, pausing them as you go to try out different things in the software, and then at the end, practicing everything you've learned for at least 40 minutes, following my suggestions and using the provided sessions and worksheets, so each module has at least an hour spent on it. This way, it's more likely that everything you've learned will sync in properly. Also, if you have any questions about anything, then you can contact me on support at reasoncourses.com or by going to the Producer Tech Forum where you can discuss issues with other students and myself. This first module is a little different from the others, though, in that I'm going to briefly go over some concepts and introduce you to some of the main areas of the software, as well as show you how to set up. So you needn't necessarily practice anything after this module and could just move straight on to the next one, where you'll be learning about how to get started with a new session and the basics of MIDI. After you've first booted up the software, then, the first thing you have to do is to add your Reason license to your ignition key, which is the USB stick that comes with the software, by logging into your user account online and then entering your serial number when prompted to do so. The simplest way to run the software is to have your key inserted at all times, but there are two other options. Should you not have your key, then you could use Internet Verification Mode, which allows you to log into your online account and authorize the software from there. Or there's demo mode, where the software functions normally, but you can't open song files. Next thing to do is to set up the preferences. This is essential when any audio software is first launched, so you can tell it where to send audio to, where to get it from, what MIDI devices and controllers you might be using, and so on. So let's get started. The preferences window is selected from the main reason menu, or using the associated keyboard shortcut. In the Preferences window, you can choose from a number of options in the menu at the top to select the preferences you want to view or change. We're going to start with Audio. In the Audio Preferences, the main option to set is Audio Device. This defines the audio hardware that you want to use as an input and output source with the software. So to send audio from the software to any connected speakers with the outputs, or if using Reason 6, to record a vocal or instrument with the inputs. So, if you have a sound card or interface connected and installed, then you should select it from the list. If you don't have a sound card or interface at this stage, then you can just select the built-in output on your computer, after which you can listen to the software via the built-in speakers, or connect speakers or headphones to the audio output on your computer, which probably has a mini jack connector. I have a Focusrite Sapphire 6 USB interface connected and have run the installer, which places the driver for it on my computer. So it now shows up and can be selected in the list here. The box below then contains all the settings of my interface. The first one is sample rate, where you can choose 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. Sample rate literally means the number of audio samples per second for all digital audio in the song. Setting a higher rate here will mean that any audio recorded will have a larger file size but also improved quality, although the improvements are often subtle and difficult to detect. 44.1 kHz is the default setting, and this is the rate used on CDs, so it's become the standard. I've always found the quality of 44.1 to be good enough, and have never needed to raise the rate any higher. But if you want to improve the resolution, then you have the option. The next option allows you to set a buffer size. The buffer size basically defines how much latency your system has. Latency is another term you'll become accustomed to as you go. It's another word for delay, in this case caused by your computer processing the audio. Basically, increasing the buffer size adds more delay to the audio going in and out of your system, but your computer doesn't have to work as hard. And decreasing it means that the system has to work harder to lessen the delay. 512 samples is a fairly high setting these days, and the latency created by this is still only just audible so you can probably get away with a lower setting here without your computer struggling. 
but it depends what kit you have, and also what sample rate you set above, with higher sample rates making your computer work harder too. I can also see here that I have two inputs on my Sapphire. These inputs only show up in Reason 6's preferences and not earlier versions of the software, which don't allow audio to be recorded. And then there are four outputs, but only two of the outputs are activated, which again saves processing power. If I want to use the extra outputs, which you won't need right now but may later on, then you can activate them here. Another preferences section you need to know about here is the keyboards and control surfaces one. This is where you set up and manage any MIDI controllers you might have. Propellerhead software has very good integration with most controllers and is pretty easy to set up. Normally you can just click on auto detect surfaces and your controller should show up in the box below. Failing that though, you can always add it manually by first selecting the manufacturer and then the product in the next option. I'm using an Ovation Remote SL keyboard, which works a little differently as I have to manually add the keyboard itself separately. Again though, the software makes it very easy to set this up, as I don't even need to select an input MIDI port from the list below. I can just click on Find, and then play the keyboard keys, and it's done automatically. Once set up, you can play instruments with the keys, and often adjust their controls with any knobs or buttons as well, just by clicking on their track in the Sequencer section. If you don't have a MIDI controller, then it's not a problem as you can easily play instruments using other means, including your computer keyboard, which is activated by the software's on-screen piano keys facility, which is explained fully in the next module. Some other preferences you may find handy at this stage are in the general section. The main ones I'll bring to your attention for now are under appearance, where you can deactivate tooltips if you wish, this is a pop-up explanation of different areas of the software that you'll see when the mouse cursor pauses over a control. I personally think it's really handy, and it's a great way of learning what things do, so I recommend keeping it active, for now at least. Then you can choose what song first loads up with the software in the default song section. There are two empty session options. One is empty rack, which is totally empty, or you can choose the template option, which is the rack with a few effects set up. Alternatively, you can choose to open the last song on Startup, which opens the project you're currently working on. It's up to you. Lastly, there's a CPU usage limit, which allows you to set the point at which record will stop working. In other words, stop producing sound. If it reaches this point, then the DSP load is too high, and you need to reduce the size of your session, or increase the buffer size, or alternatively, raise the limit a little here to give yourself a bit more headroom. Now that I've shown you how to set up the software, I'm going to take you on a tour of Reason, starting with version 6. The software has three different display areas. Two of these are basically identical to earlier versions of Reason. These are the rack and the sequencer. The sequencer is an area that you tend to see in all music making applications, and has become the standard way music is arranged. The tracks in your session are stacked vertically on top of one another, with each one having its own horizontal lane. These tracks can be for instruments, in which case they are MIDI tracks, and you find these tracks in all versions of Reason, or they could be audio tracks containing recorded or imported audio. These tracks are only available in Reason 6. The blocks of MIDI or audio on these tracks are called clips, and can be laid out in any way you like in the Edit Arrangement pane. Then when you play your song by hitting play on the transport, the song position pointer scrolls along the bar ruler, playing all of the clips laid out below. The switches on the toolbar at the top allow you to change the function of the mouse in the sequencer, so you can perform various edits. These switches can also be activated using the top row of letters on your computer keyboard, from Q to U. So it's really quick and easy to zoom in using the magnify tool, and then drag the sequencer left and right with the hand tool. Then slice clips with the razor tool, and so on. It's also really easy to navigate around the sequencer thanks to the track navigator, which you can drag to scroll up and down your tracks. Meanwhile, the song navigator at the bottom shifts left and right along the timeline. 
or if you drag the edges of the blue rectangle, then you can zoom in and out of your song. Each track can also have a number of lanes, which makes it easier to try out different chords with synths, or give certain drums from a drum sampler their own lane to provide unique mixing options. If you want to edit any of the clips, then you can enter edit mode by double-clicking a clip, after which the appropriate edit mode is activated. For example, the clip on a track for one of Reason's synthesizers is edited in key edit mode, where you can see the piano keyboard running down the left side and have a grid alongside showing you when each MIDI note is playing. Or the clip on a track for Reason's drum sampler Kong is edited in drum edit mode, where the drums run down the left side instead, and a similar grid to the right displays the drums that are playing in the clip and allows you to make changes to them. You can return to song mode by deactivating the edit mode switch or using the backwards arrow. Recording new audio clips, such as a vocal or guitar part, is done just by hitting the record switch on a lane and then hitting record on the transport. And the process is identical for MIDI clips, only you're recording the notes you play with your MIDI keyboard or the on-screen piano keyboard rather than actual audio. The record switch on the transport can be deactivated during recording to switch to regular play mode. And the stop button can be clicked twice to jump back to the start of the song. To the left of the main transport controls are the tempo and time signature boxes. The tempo is the speed of your song and is measured in the number of beats per minute. You can click and drag up and down with the mouse to change this. A common hip hop tempo is around 100 BPM. House music is typically around 125 BPM, and a drum and bass track tends to be something like 160 or 170 BPM. The time signature is a little more complex and signifies the number and division of beats in each bar. For example, 4 4 signifies that there are four crotchets in each bar, which is the most common time signature by far that you will find in virtually all pop music, for example, where each crotchet represents the kick drum in a house track. A waltz time signature would normally be 3 4, which is three crotchets in a bar, or a faster 3 8, which is three quavers in a bar. It's unlikely that you'll need to worry about time signature for now, though. Other useful features on the transport are the metronome, or click, which provides a handy indication of timing when recording, a display that has meters for audio input and output levels, as well as DSP usage, a switch for turning loop on and off, with the left and right locators shown below, and a switch for displaying the regroove mixer, where you can apply and adjust grooves for any instrument lanes in the sequencer. Now let's take a look at the rack. This is where all of the instruments, effects, and other devices in the session live. It looks exactly like a hardware rack you'd find in a studio, and can even be flipped around by hitting the tab key on your computer keyboard to see how things are cabled up. If we take a look at the rack in Reason 5 now, you can see it looks virtually the same as the one in Record. The difference here, though, is with the default display, the rack and sequencer share the software window, and you can resize each by dragging the divider. Alternatively, you can use the switch at the side to split off the sequencer, after which it has its own window separate from the rack, which can be maximized to fill the screen. These windows can then be toggled using the window menu, which also contains the other available windows, like the on-screen piano keys and the tool window. The tool window, which you can also make appear and disappear with the F8 key, is a useful window that provides a host of different editing options for certain areas of the software, as well as the device palette. Selecting from the device palette is one way of adding devices to the rack. In it, you can see a list of all the instruments, effects and other devices that come with the software. As far as instruments go, you've got three synthesizers, two samplers, a loop player and two drum instruments. Then, for effects, there are four M-Class mastering effects. Advanced reverb, distortion and vocoding. And then a whole load of half-rack effects, which are simpler effects units for carrying out different audio processing. Then at the end, you've got extra devices like the combinator, some additional mixers, 
and then various devices for carrying out more advanced signal processing. To add a device to the rack, you just double-click it or drag it in. Every instrument, as well as many of the effects, come with a host of presets or patches, which have the front panel controls set up a certain way in order to produce different types of sound. You can scroll through all available patches using the up and down arrows, with the patch name shown on the display alongside. Or you can click on the switch with the folder symbol to open the browser and select a patch from there. As you can see, the devices have their own folders in the Reason Factory sound bank, which have all patches placed into different categories based on type. So for a synth like this, you have basses, FX, pads, and so on. All of the front panel controls can be adjusted with the mouse in exactly the same way as on a hardware synth with the knobs rotated by clicking and dragging up and down, just like the sliders. However, there are some tips here that make control adjustment easier. For example, clicking on buttons which toggle between different modes steps through the modes one by one, as you'd expect. But if you just click on one of the modes instead, then it switches straight to that one, which is quicker. Also, if you hold down Shift whilst adjusting a control, then it makes the control adjustment finer so it allows you to make smaller changes. And if you hold down the control key with a PC or Apple key with a Mac, then click on a control, then it returns it to its default position. Lastly, wherever you see a display, you can click and drag up and down, or click and then select from a pop-up menu to choose additional options. And you can use these tips on all devices in the rack, and also the mixer in Reason 6. An alternative way to add an instrument to the rack is to click on the Create Instrument switch in the Tool window, which opens up the browser and then allows you to browse according to the type of sound you want to make. The difference here is that you're not limiting yourself to one instrument, but are searching for a particular sound that could be created with any of the instruments. Another way of adding devices to the rack is using the rack's context menu. Throughout the software, context menus make editing much quicker and easier by providing additional options. Context menus are brought up by right-clicking with a PC or holding down the control key on a Mac and clicking with the mouse, after which a list of options appears. You can see that this changes depending on what you click on. If you click on the space at the bottom of the rack, then the context menu is actually the create menu from above, which allows you to choose any of the devices you can add as well as the Create Instrument option, and a Create Effect option too. Like the Create Instrument option, this provides a way of searching for a particular type of effect without limiting yourself to one device. In fact, a lot of the options you can choose aren't just one effect, but are actually a load of different effects put together in a device called the Combinator. You can tell these patches because they end in CMB. And then if you look at the Details section at the bottom, you can see what effects are used in each one. The Combinator can contain any instruments, effects or other devices, all cabled up a certain way and with various settings, so that they create a particular instrument with a combination of effects, or a load of layered instruments combined, and so on. Then, certain parameters from the devices within have been mapped to the front panel, and can be adjusted by tweaking the knobs or pressing the buttons. <laughs> With Reason 5, any instruments placed in the rack are automatically connected to a 14-channel mixer device at the top, with the instrument name appearing on the next free fader, from where the level can be adjusted to make changes to the volume. And any other mixer controls can be accessed, such as mute and solo buttons, panning, EQing, and so on. The Reason 6 mixer is slightly larger, and so isn't a rack-mounted device. It works the same way as in Reason, though, in that any instrument added to the rack is automatically given a channel strip on the mixer, with the name written underneath. As in Reason, we've got the mixer level controls and panning, but here there are way more options for signal processing and effects, which I imagine look pretty intimidating at this stage. But I'll be teaching you about most of them throughout the course to get you feeling more at ease. As you can see, 
navigating around the mixer is done in a similar way to the sequencer, with strips above and to the side for scrolling up and down and left and right. As well as having a separate mixer, the other big difference with Reason 6, of course, is the ability to record and import audio into the sequencer. This is done by adding audio tracks, which are given a channel strip on the mixer, just like instruments in the rack, to allow mixing. And similarly, have an audio track device in the rack itself, to which you can add effects, in the same way as you would when processing instruments. In a similar way to Reason, there are dividers in between the mixer, rack and sequencer to allow you to resize the different sections. As well as switches around the edges for separating certain sections off into their own window. However, by far the best means of displaying the sections is to use the function keys, as you can see in the window menu. F5 for the mixer, F6 for the rack and F7 for the sequencer. Pressing any of these individually brings up that section on its own. Or you can press them together in different combinations. So to bring up the mixer and sequencer, I just press F5 and F7. Lastly, like all software, if you look in the edit menu, you can see there are undo and redo commands, along with keyboard shortcuts for them. I use these regularly, particularly when demonstrating to get rid of something I just did and demonstrate another way of doing it instead. You have a total of 30 undo steps, so even if you make a lot of mistakes, then it's still possible to undo them all whilst the song is open. I'm sure all of that was a bit much to take on in one go, but we'll be going through all of these things in more detail as we work through the course. This module was just designed to introduce you to some concepts and to start to get your head around how the software works. Before moving on, Make sure any sound cards or audio interfaces you have are correctly installed and set up in the audio preferences, as well as any MIDI controllers you might be using, such as a USB controller keyboard. It's by no means necessary to have any of these things though, and for now you could make do with the audio ins and outs on your computer, and use the computer keyboard for playing in parts. Also make sure you've downloaded the course packs containing all of the Reason song files, as well as the included samples and presets. You can find links for these at the top of the main course page, with all the movie links on. Next time, we're diving straight in and looking at how to get started with a new song, and how to start playing MIDI instruments. Bye for now.